morning. Welcome to Taking Stock, the 40th in this series. You appear to have caught me lounging around in the garden in the summer sunshine, rather than slaving over a hot desk. Appropriate, I think, because I want to talk about waiting today. Because I think we're all spending quite a lot of time these days waiting. Waiting for things to change, waiting for the right time to try and get back to something approaching normal. Some of us might be preparing for a long-awaited holiday. Some might be waiting to go back to work after furlough. I know that with uh, August the 1st being only a couple of days away, many Methodist ministers will be preparing to move out of their current manse and hiking up or down the road somewhere, probably most often to a new appointment, but some into retirement. And everyone with 16 or 18 year olds know what it's like as they come to close to the end of that agonising wait for exam results, especially in this topsy-turvy year. But waiting can often be a gift from God, and despite the mostly gregarious nature of human beings, so is occasional solitude. Some people, using modern idiom, talk about giving somebody some space, but I prefer to think of waiting and solitude as giving God some space. I've lost count of the number of times I've heard people quote from Kipling about filling the unforgiving minute. But what I want to think about here is what we do with the forgiving minutes God gives us. We spend a lot of time in our lives doing things, or planning to do them, or recovering from the effects of doing them. Somehow we lose sight of the idea that whilst time is precious, it's not wasted simply because we've nothing supposedly productive to show for the time which may have passed. If you think about it, the whole connotation of the word wait is restricted, impatient, negative. Any woman who's ever given birth knows what it's like to be waiting for a pregnancy to end. If one more person cheerfully asks you, still waiting then, when they meet you out shopping, you're going to scream. Anyone who's ever taken an exam knows what it's like to be waiting for the results. Your nerves are screwed up, taut, and the tension's unbearable as you wait for the email or the brown envelope to drop through the door or the list to be posted up on the school or university notice board however it is you receive your results these days. Any child who, days before Christmas, sees presents under the Christmas tree just begging to be ripped open and being told to wait, it isn't time yet, knows how unfair it feels that Christmas cannot be now. We're not good at waiting for anything, and even worse at making waiting a positive rather than a debilitating experience, and yet we have the carpenter's story to show us how we could be enriched if only we could accept that periods of waiting could, and even should, be periods of enrichment for all of us. Jesus knew the value of solitude and of waiting. Several times in the Gospels we have accounts to show how he apparently disappeared, went off on his own. Sometimes, it seems, he went up to one of the high places by himself. We have at least one occasion where he is scolded by Simon Peter who says, Lord, where have you been? We've been looking for you everywhere. Remember too that all the Gospels are trying to cover over three years in the life of Jesus and we only have sketches of those times, the salient points. How many times during that period do you imagine Jesus may have sought solitude, must have spent time waiting, which were not reported in the Gospels? You might say that the whole of his adulthood was a period of waiting. The last incident, incident recorded after his birth, but before he commenced his ministry, at roughly the age of 30, occurred when he was 13. Is it possible that the whole of that 17 year gap, that 17 year wait for the right time to be fulfilled, what some call the hidden years, was somehow wasted? No, certainly not. But we've succumbed to the tyranny of the clock and the calendar. And we've made a time of waiting into a time of trial, rather than a period for reflection and restoration. There were advertisements on TV a few years ago, inviting people to take up the option of acquiring a credit card. I don't remember whose credit card it was, or even most of the advert shows the power of advertising, doesn't it? But it ended with the words, why wait? Well, there's a blessing in waiting. However much we have made waiting a dirty word and a negative concept, both in our personal lives and in our society. 
The Bible is full of images of waiting. David the psalmist makes several references to the concept of waiting on the Lord. Although it has to be said that he uses the concept both positively and negatively, there's still overall a sense that to be able to wait for the Lord or indeed anything else is a blessing, a period of rest, a recollection, of recreation and recreation. If you like, a sense of Sabbath, which our society has lost. And now a shudder runs down the spine at the mention of Sabbath. I've heard a lot of tales from the older members of my various churches about how, how their parents and grandparents kept the Sabbath. And it makes me really glad to be 20 years younger and having been brought up by atheists. I can only imagine the horror with which I would have greeted the prospect of their so-called Sabbath. No playing, no reading of unsuitable material, which meant that the only things which could be read were the Bible and Lives of the Saints or some such. You must wear your best clothes at all times. There was to be no listening to the wireless, that's the radio to you and me, no shouting. You could sew if you were a girl. And of course all this was interspersed with going to church three times each Sunday. Morning and evening service and afternoon Sunday school. They called this a day of rest. Sounds more like a day in prison to me. How joyless, how bloodless and how boring. Someone did a survey a few years ago, asking people this question. If every day were to have its own colour, what colour would Sunday be? 60% of all respondents and 85% of people over the age of 60 said grey. Is it any wonder? We've made Sabbath grey and boring. And in reaction, society has kicked the whole concept into touch. To wait for something, be it the beginning of the new working week, or the coming of the holiday, or your favourite chocolate, is seen to be boring and unnecessary. I am not now, and have never been, a member of the Lord's Day Observance Society, and nor will I ever be, whilst the Sabbath is seen to be something prissy, dull, restrictive and boring. I'm afraid I cannot get too worked up about people working on Sunday, if that's what they choose to do, and they're free to choose not to work. I spent three years on 24-hour shifts which demanded that I work two out of three Sundays and don't recall having to dodge any divine lightning bolts when I got on the train on Sunday to go to work. I cannot get worked up either about disrespecting God's word by making Sunday like any other day since if we're going to be literal about it, according to the Bible and Jewish tradition, Sunday is like any other day. It's Saturday, which is Sabbath. If Sunday is the Lord's day rather than the Sabbath, where does it say in the New Testament that everything must stop or shut down on that Lord's day? I can, though, get worked up when society fragments itself by refusing to acknowledge corporately that there is one time in the week which it's agreed needs to be set aside as far as possible for rest and recreation for as many people as possible. As a Christian, I am one who has often been described as restless and scurrying. I want to put in a plea for anyone who seeks God to put in some time waiting. Not reading, not swimming, not cabinet making or doing counted cross stitch and certainly not gardening. Just being will do. We lock God out of busy lives, become slaves of the clock. And then complain when God does not reveal himself to us in the five minute window of opportunity we have deigned to give him at 10.45am each Sunday. We cram the hole in the middle of godless lives with worthless stuff. And God has to force himself into the interstices we leave. No wonder his voice appears to be muffled in our lives. Waiting time is good time. It's time not just for us to be restored and refreshed, that's what we sleep for. Waiting time is not just the romantic moment which allows us to get away from the great unwashed heaving mass of humanity and gaze across Windermere or from the peak of Snowdon, that's a holiday. There's nothing wrong with either of those things, of course, but think about where your senses are in any situation which causes you to wait. They're out there, aren't they? Every sense you have when you are negatively aware of waiting is heightened, straining to interpret the information which is pouring in. 
You might say that your awareness is centred not on you, but outside yourself. Waiting can and ought to be sufficient unto itself, not merely the pause between incidents, but an incident in itself. A time when, in the stillness that envelops us, when we accord a time of waiting its own integrity, its own quality, we can become aware of God's continued presence, over and above and within and through our own lives. Well, in that same way, in that same sense of turning yourself outward, when you wait under stress, as it were, you can wait for God, not with frustration, not with anger, not with restlessness, but in deep peace and in deep confidence. You can wait with and for God in the bus on the way to work. Or you can wait with and for God in the not quiet silence of a forest or the happy buzz you can hear while children play in the gardens around you or in the local park. But if you do not wait, if you cannot wait, how are you ever going to make time to hear what God has to say to you in the now? Wait and stay safe.